Rookie. Welcome to VBF Online. Please visit our website, vbf.org, and while you're there, you can watch the latest message. Follow us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also donate to our ministry by going and clicking the Tithe Here button. You can do that, or you can also mail us a check. If you have a cool story that you would like to share with us, you can email us at share at vbf.org. Thank you so much for watching BBF Online. We hope that you enjoy the message. How's everybody doing? You guys look amazing. Let's stand on our feet. We're going to pray. God is going to do something great. Do you guys believe it? All right. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you so much. We are so blessed to be able to come today in the house of the Lord to worship you, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit is already moving in this place, God. Anoint the worship. Anoint Pastor Ron as he brings the message. Then open up our hearts, God, that when we leave here today, we are not the same. We're more closer. We're more connected to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
church fam, my name is Allie. And I'm John. In 2024, we believe that God wants us to grow and expand as a team. If you play an instrument or you sing, come and meet Allie and I in the foyer at the East Campus on Saturday, February 10th at 10 a.m. Come get plugged into all things music here at VBF. Ages 16 and up. So let's encourage, inspire, and motivate our VBF church family through song. We hope you can join us. That is right. Hopefully you guys don't miss out on that. Whether you're in here or you are online February 10th, we are looking forward to meeting you. We're looking forward to getting our worship team to expand in the giftings that God has given to you. So if you would, please join us February 10th. It's happening. And uh, if you are joining us for the first time here tonight, welcome. Welcome to Valley Bible Fellowship. This is what we do on Wednesday nights. We're so thankful that you are here. Yeah, give them a, a round of applause for all you new we do really care about you. It's why we're here. And so um, if you would like to get plugged in, if you'd like to find out some more information, you can scan this QR code or you can stop by the hub before you leave here this evening. We would love to get you connected and get you some information so uh, we can be with you in this journey until we get to heaven. Amen. Come on. Uh, we are asking, We are. it's that time of year again, best of Bakersfield, and uh, we are asking if you would be so kind as to go to the website that's on the screen and vote for VBF as best place to worship. This is a, a, a twofold uh, reason why we are, are asking for this. Not only, not only is it something that we get to tell our own community about, but there have been people who have come to our church simply because they Googled churches in Bakersfield. And this is one of those ways that we can help get our name to follow into that slot. So if you would, take some time, go to uh, the website on the screen and vote for VBF as best place to worship. We would love to get as many people as we possibly can to know about the message of Jesus Christ through our ministry. So if you would, that helps us out a whole lot. Something we're doing new uh, this year is our baptism celebration. Um, if any of you have been wanting to get baptized recently and you are wondering what day to do it, this Sunday would be the day to do it. At all of our campuses, we are having a big celebration. So if you would, invite your family, invite your friends, and uh, we're going to make this a, a, a moment where you can look back on it years from now and, and say, these are the people that were with me on the day that I got baptized. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is Sunday, February 1st, or sorry, 4th, which is this Sunday. So if you would, please sign up under the patio if you would like to get baptized. We are having our night of worship. We're back for 2024. Night of worship, we are back. So if you would join us this Sunday, February 4th at um, uh, 6 p.m. at our uh, station 316 here at our East Campus, we are, we're seeking the Lord together. We started something last year and it is just uh, steamrolled into something amazing. So please join us for that this Sunday. Mighty women, you ladies are getting together this Tuesday. Um, yeah, that's right. 9.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at our Northwest campus. If you plan on attending, please let us know by going to vbfwomen.com. There will be worship, there's teaching, table talk, great food, and yes, ladies, childcare provided. So please attend and let them know that you're going to whichever one fits your schedule, 9.30 or 6. And then we have Man Cave for you men, February 13th. That's right. So that is um, at 6 p.m. at our East campus. It's station 316, and then that following Saturday will be at our Northwest campus. We're bringing back the Saturday man caves at our Northwest campus. So don't miss out. It's going to be great food, fellowship. It's going to be a great time. If you need more information, please go to vbf.org. Uh, lastly, we have our tithes and our offerings coming around. If you are online, you can go to vbf.org, click the tithe here tab. You can also send something in to 2300 East Brendage Lane. And with that being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get into the the rest of this evening. Father, we pray for your hand to be on tonight. We thank you in advance for the message that you have given to pastor. We ask for a blessing over the offering, over the giver, and over the time that we have here tonight. We love you, Father. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, well, come on, let's stand back up together.
God, we praise you. We praise you. Amen. You may be seated. Cool hat. Thank you. Can I get one of those? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Tom. How you all doing this evening? Okay, I already got a complaint, and I'm just in here. Guys, I don't know what's wrong with these lights, but they're blinding me. Uh, I have been here on a night, I guess. I, these don't have these in the daytime, but they're, they're blinding. Uh, We'll have to get the light guys in. I can, I can see a little bit. It's like somebody with a spotlight in your eyes. Uh, I guess it doesn't bother the other guys. They're, they're younger, I guess, so we'll get through it. Say we'll get through it. Okay. Uh, I guess they do it for videos and stuff, I think. So uh, if my forehead's shining too much, you know. At least I got a little bit of hair left to cover it. Uh, Y'all doing good tonight? I'm doing well, thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody listen to Off the Mountain podcast today, yesterday? Someone caught me at the back door and said, whatever happened to that demon? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? A podcast. Oh. oh, oh. Um, tonight we're going to start something. And uh, we're not trying to make crowds on Wednesday night any longer. We're trying to make disciples. Huge difference. Some of you, it's going to have raw, raw too. Tonight it's not. Tonight I'm giving a prototype for you, a model for what we're going to be doing. And uh, if I had a title this thing tonight, it's women's position in the church. And uh, so anyway, somebody liked it over there. 
But we're, we're going to start. I have felt this burden for a long, long time that we've got to get back to teaching the Word and sharing with people why do we believe what we believe. Now, next week you might really want to come because I might be talking about miracles and signs and wonders and why we believe that and using a lot of stuff out of the Bible or the personal walk. So, but tonight we're going to do it a little differently. But there is something here for you. You've got to hear it. So, Father God, right now, anoint me as a vessel as I share the Word and teach the Word, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, why is it important for us to have the right belief system? And why is it to have, important to have the right belief system and know why we believe in it? Uh, to become a true disciple of Christ, what I'm doing here on the next few Wednesday nights, I don't know if we three, four, eight, nine, ten, I don't know. This is not an option. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, this is a must do. So why is it important for you to know what we believe in and why we believe in it? Number one, it's a command in Scripture. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly, correctly explains the word of truth. Look at this same verse in the Message Bible. Repeat these basic essentials over and over to God's people. Warn them before God against pious nitpicking, which chips away at the faith. It just wears everyone out. Concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of, laying out the truth in a plain and simple way. Now, some people might think that we're uh, delusional because of the way we live. The way I preach the Christian message, people could easily think you're delusional. Our life is so countercultural to the life that non-believers are living. Let me just tell you something. If your life's not somewhat countercultural, you, you definitely aren't living this right, right, this life right. It's going to be. Uh, if you are living this life right, you are going to occasionally be praying with somebody out there in the marketplace. Occasionally, you're going to be sharing your faith on and on and on. So they might look at us and go, you're, you're just delusional. Because uh, there's a lot of people out there they have never been exposed to a real Christian. I said something the other day. I got some really good friends. And I never knew what a good friend was till I got a good friend. Yeah. Mike Maggard and Randy Garrett and these guys. I, I've had friends in my life in the past decade. I thought they were friends, but I didn't know what a good friend was until I got a good friend. And the same token, to know normal, you got to see normal. And so, the world out there has not seen a lot of people living the Christian life in front of them. See, we're countercultural. We say just like, like, you know, off the top of our head, oh, God spoke to me the other day, and he, he really convicted me of this, and God did this, and we tie 10% of our income to the church. We go to church every Sunday. We try not to miss. We, we, we talk about prayer and, and the Holy Spirit, and we talk about angels and demons, and, and people sometimes are going to think, you're out of your mind. Look at Mark 3, 20 and 21. It says, one time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away because they said, he is out of his mind. That might be said about us. He's out of his mind. I mean, I remember years ago, I'm doing my income tax, and somebody says, what, you gave how much to the church? I said, well, I tithe 10% of my income to the church. You gave this many thousand dollars to church? Yeah, because that's what we do. And besides, I'm kind of selfish. I want God to take my 90% and turn it to 120, so I give him 10. Uh, and then Acts 26, 24, suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, you're literally insane. Too much study has made you crazy. See, he thought he was insane. Uh, I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.13. Paul says, uh, if this seems 
I'm crazy. It's for the glory of God. But if we're in our right mind, it's for your benefit. I think Paul was saying, what I have to do very often is when I come to you, I'm so pumped about hearing God, about deliverance, about, about what God's doing in my life. All these, I'm so hyped about God that I have to bring myself down so I can talk to you logically. And I don't do a good job of that sometimes. I get carried away a lot. Now, we are told in Scripture to be able to explain why we believe what we believe. That's what it says. We're a, we're, and we're supposed to use the Bible to do it. Now, now let me share something with you. I, I got this today, and I've never taught it before. I just got it from God. I'm going to give you an acronym. Uh, this is one way we can test a doctrine to see if it's right on or not. And it's S-E-F, S-E-F, S-E-F. And here it is on the screen. First, when we're, we're talking about a doctrine in the Bible, we're going to say, is it scriptural? Then secondly, experience. Does it line up with personal experience? And F, is it fruitful? Does it bear fruit? Let's use an example. If you're familiar with the faith movement out there, the faith movement, as we call it sometimes, when we tease the people, we go, it's the blab it, grab it. It's, uh, you know, uh, blab it, grab it, and I don't think they got other terms for it. But the faith movement, one of their teachings is, by his stripes we were healed, so everybody should be healed. Now, let's apply that to this SEF up here. Thank you for keeping it up. Is that scriptural that by his stripes you were healed? That has to do with spiritual healing, not physical. So they'll say yes, I say no. E, experience, does it line up? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Like I said last week, Friday night, I, I thought I was going on with COVID. I was sick. And I believe, this is my opinion, I was able to pray that away, but I also took silver. But I think I was able to pray it away because I knew it was God's will for me to be here on Sunday because he had told me. He had given me this message weeks before I knew I was supposed to teach it. So I basically held his word up and said, it says right here, God, if, if you ask anything according to your will, he, you hear us and we get it. And I know that it's your will for me to be here on Sunday, so you've got to heal me. And he did. Now, can I pray away every virus? No, I cannot. I cannot. But I went back to Scripture. Uh, ministry of deliverance. We, we actually deliver people from demons. That we believe in that. Not, it might be next week. You don't want to miss. We're going to get into some pretty crazy stuff. But, uh, I mean, deliverance is crazy. Let's test it with our, our SEF. Is it scriptural? Hey, yeah, hello. If you didn't hear the podcast this morning or yesterday morning, Listen to me closely. Duh, what are we thinking? You know how many churches in Bakersfield, how many churches believe that, that deliverances don't happen anymore, those are miracles, they're gone away, da 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 What are they thinking? We had, the demons were silent pretty much in the Old Testament. You didn't see a lot. But remember this violent period that came between John the Baptist and Jesus we talked about it last Sunday. Uh, when they started confronting the demons, all hell broke loose. They were everywhere. And so, uh, so you saw demons all through the Gospels, through the book of Acts. You see them. They're, they're all out there. They're, they're intersecting with our world. So what happened? A lot of our churches are bigger, so what happened? So the Bible got written so the demons, they just went back in the holes in the ground somewhere. And I say they just disappeared. You don't think people need that as much today as they did then? We got people that come to church every week, some that might be possessed with demons. Yeah, I do. And if not possessed, oppressed. They look a lot alike. What I'm saying is, you put it to the test. We're going we're to dig in this stuff. Valley Bible's not just a church that's emotionalism church that just came up with all these doctrines. It's based on the Word of God. And it's based on, on this SCF right here. Uh, devotions, Mark 9, 9. Let's go through real quick. This is in devotions just a few days back. Mark 9. Let me show you something. It's amazing. When I read this stuff, I go, oh, my goodness. Uh, let's look at Mark 9, and I'm going to read you 14 to 29. See, I brought my Bible. See, this is a Bible. Did you all know that? You don't have to always look at that big screen. You, know, you can look at your phone. Phone's great. That's great. Uh, okay, verse 14, Mark 9. And when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and some scribes arguing with him. Do you know the difference between a scribe and a Sadducee and a Pharisee? Who was a scribe in the Old Testament? Ezra was. 
The scribes were more of a political party thing, and the Pharisees, they were religious. The Sadducees, they always fought with the Pharisees, but they all combined to attack Jesus. And verse 15, immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed, and they began running up, probably running over each other, bumping into each other, trying to get there first to greet him. Remember my sermon Sunday? The kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take up by force. This is violence here. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. Hello. I believe, you don't have to share, share this belief, that there are some people mute and blind. Some, not, not all, not the majority, but some, and it's caused from demons. You could leave the demon, and they can probably hear and see. Some. I also believe that if a couple of us, two or three, get into some of the mental institutions in the country, that we would come out with a few people in the perfect mind. Because they're in there because they're demon-possessed. Some. Some. Most of them, they're broken. We know all that. But I'm just saying some. Because I'm still living this. That nothing's changed. No one can show me one verse where that lifestyle has changed. And Jesus said the same things I do, you'll do likewise. What kind of things was he talking about? And so it goes on here, and this word gets really, really relational, or it gets, uh, and relational is not the word I want to use. It gets very, uh, it, it comes home with me. In verse 18, and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth. Wait, hold. Who, who heard Off the Mountain podcast Tuesday? Foams at the mouth. That's what I see. It happens the same way very often. So it, it foams at the mouth in verse 18, grinds his teeth, stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they couldn't do it. And he answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long should I be with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him, and I'll kind of skip over some stuff here. And immediately the Spirit threw him into convulsion. When, when, when spirits are in people and they see somebody coming that they know has knowledge, they start acting up really bad. I went in the back room one day and a pastor was trying to do a deliverance by himself. He shouldn't have. When I walked in, the demon said, I know him and I hate him, pointing at me. I know him. I hate him. Get him out of the room. And he started really acting up. So I look at this and I go, I, I know all this. And he began rolling about and foaming at the mouth. And from childhood, verse 21 says, Verse 22, he throws him in the fire of water, tries to destroy him. In verse 23, the Lord says, all things are possible to him who believes. Verse 24, uh, the Father says, I do believe, help my unbelief. And so, verse 25, I'm running to the back room crazy, keeping up with me. And when Jesus saw a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him. Don't enter him again. I've done this so many times. Except I have to do it in Jesus' name. He didn't have to do it in Jesus' name because he was Jesus. <laughs> and after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them thought he died. Do you know how many young men and women I've had in my arms after a deliverance? They pass, not like they pass out. There's been such a battle. I mean, they just like they pass out. And you know, man, the job's been done. Sometimes it makes 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. And then in verse 28, well, first Jesus 27 takes his hand and raises him up. 28, they said, and when he had come into the house, the disciples being a questioning privately, why could we not cast it out? And he says, basically, you got to be prayed up to do this one. And if you're not prayed up, you can't do it. This is one advantage of, of bringing people sometimes up to the elders and let them pray over them. It's not because we're more holy than you, but we should be prayed up. We don't have to work eight to five. We should be prayed up and ready to go. Now, I will say this. People will think I'm crazy because I don't like to at all equate myself with a TV evangelist where they push people over and everything. I just, I don't need any of that. But it started about 10 years ago, and I don't know why. But especially after I preach, I guess maybe there's anointing. But very often, and Pastor Tom will tell you, Hector, all the guys, somebody will come up, and, and, and after talking to them, we'll think, they're demonized in some way. And when, when I go to pray for them, I'll look at Tom or Hector and I'll go, get around behind him, go get around him. And very often when we 
take authority over the spirits and start doing spiritual authority on them, they fall over. They collapse. And I never, never know why that happens, and I just have a theory. I think when the demons leave, it's such a jolt. They, they fall down. I, th- I think that has something to do with it. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. You don't need to know that probably, but, but it does happen. And so, speaking in tongues, that's a doctrine we'll be talking about. Uh, does it line up with our SEF? Well, it's scriptural, definitely. Uh, does experience bear it out? Well, kind of. There's a lot of people speaking in tongues. I don't do it. And when we get to the doctor, I'll tell you why I don't do it. Is it fruitful? Not really. The people that I see speaking in tongues, usually a lot of confusion, is not, not really good fruit. And uh, so I, I, I don't do it. I have spoken in tongues before. We'll find out when we get that doctrine that speaking in tongues is always praise to God. Yes. Always praise to God. When you go into a Pentecost church, they go, and, they, that, and then they say, thus saith the Lord. Somebody quote unquote interprets it. That's, you know, the Lord says to you, or right away it's not the interpretation because it's always praise to God. Amen. And, and what's weird, I mean, you've you got to have some smarts. Somebody speaks in tongues for uh, 10 seconds and, and the interpretation's two minutes long. Hello, no, no, that doesn't match up. Okay, I'm some dumb, but I ain't, I ain't that dumb. Or are you hear in the tongues, on the day, on the day, on the day, on the day. You go, wait a minute, no repetition in the interpretation? There is repetition there, baby. I saw it. I came out of the Pentecost church. I can talk about it. I love those people. They're brothers and sisters in Christ, but they're doing some stuff wrong. That's why I got out. I went, no, 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 this is not biblical. Uh, you know, speaking in tongues, I, I, was, I was at a, a pastor's camp years ago. I was a pastor with the Foursquare International, and uh, I was a young guy, and I'll give you an example of this. And I went up one day, and I had a divisional superintendent. In fact, he had a church over here in Terrace Way. He was my divisional superintendent. There was about seven pastors under him because I was young. I had a church four times bigger than him, but he was still my boss. And uh, we went up to, to Old Oak Ranch, and he was there, Brother Cooper. And uh, we were at chow time. We were having a pastor's conference, and it was just for all the pastors in the western district of Foursquare, probably 150 of us. And I was sitting there, and God, Holy Spirit, talking to me. We'll, we'll be talking about this in the next weeks to come. He said, go over and tell him, you're sorry for not being a good follower. And you're sorry for your pride that you don't let him lead you because you think you're a bigger church. And you've you got an issue. You've got to take care of it. So I went over to him. I said, I just want to apologize to you. I have not been a good follower. I need to respect you. I did that. Then we went off the campgrounds to go get something to eat or do something. We came back, saw a huge crowd down on the basketball court. What's going on? Went down there. Brother Cooper was laying there dead. Looked dead. He was laying on the basketball court. And I stood there with all these Pentecostal brothers and sisters, and I heard somebody go, like that, and they said, thus saith the Lord, he shall live, he's not going to die. He'll be, he'll be with us soon, and all this stuff. And I go, come on, that's a bunch of lies. He's dead. Look at him, he's blue, he's dead. He's not coming back. And he didn't. But they, they did the tongues thing and the prophecy, he will live, da, da, da. Gang, I'm telling you. We, we got integrity here. We got to watch what we do, all right? Don't let the emotions get the best of you. Could God have raised him? Yes, he could have. Because you'll find out when we do miracles, God can do anything at any time he wants. My God's big. But I knew in that particular case, it wasn't going to happen. Eternal security. The way it's taught today. Reformed church, the Reformed theology groups, a lot of them from the Baptists, you're eternally secure. We got scripture for it. The Pentecostals over here, no, you can backslide and lose your salvation. We have scriptures for it. So who's right? Do we have eternal security or don't we have eternal security? Well, they're both right. Which one's wrong? They're both wrong. Because I've proven to you with the balls of red and blue clay that eternal security comes at some point in salvation. It doesn't come immediately when you're saved. We don't know when it comes. So you can lose your salvation, remember? You can. You can lose it until you're sanctified. Once you're sanctified, you can't lose it. When does sanctification come? We don't know. But we're going to be talking about I hope you want to be disciple, gang. We're going to go somewhere. We're going to go somewhere. Right now, that clock's going somewhere, too, and I'm watching it. 
I don't want to abuse you. Uh, idea of sin. Do we have scriptural doctrines that sin kills and destroys? We have scriptures, all kinds of scriptures. Do we have experience to bear it out? You bet we do. Do we have fruit? Yeah, bad fruit all over the place. It works. So, what if I went to a church where bad doctrine was taught? Will it hurt me? Oh, you bet it will. You have to have right doctrine. Do you know how many churches in Bakersfield? Probably the majority, maybe, maybe majority, don't believe in miracles. Did you all know that? A lot of churches, not, a lot of them don't. Now, not, it might be 50, I don't know. But there's a lot of churches that don't believe in miracles. They believe miracles cease with the days of the apostles. Well, I have news for them. I got about 100 God stories I'd like to share with them. But they do. They believe that. That, that uh, when the apostles' the time was over, that uh, miracles don't exist anymore. Now, what happens if you get in that church and get taught that? And you're told you're dying of cancer. You, you've been taught miracles don't happen anymore. So just, you know, give me some morphine and send me home. Let me die. But if you're taught the way we're taught here, we never give up hope. As long as we're breathing, we have a God that can do anything He wants anytime He wants. You can still ask God for miracles. We can pray for miracles. I mean, oh, I'm getting off my topic. I, I do get excited. When I get something, I do the 72-hour water fasting, and I, I start praying, what, what doctor I should go to, which one I shouldn't, man, because, God, we're going we're gonna to take this thing on. Okay, the second thing it does, uh, the second reason why it's so important that we know what we believe and why we believe it is it drastically affects the outcome of your life. If I did not believe the way I believe, I would be dead today. I've told you that before. My belief system saved my life. In 1977, when I was dying with leukemia, they gave me four years to live. UCLA did, four years. It's going to be over. Now, had I not believed in prayer and getting godly counsel, if I didn't believe in that, and I didn't believe in miracles, I would have just did what the doctors told me to do. I, I get older people say, well, why do you just go and just do whatever the doctor tells you to do? He's a human being. Let the doctor be your coach. Now, we have 15, 20 doctors attend here, and I love each and every one of them. But the doctor's your coach. You don't just do what he, they wanted me to do a bone marrow transplant, which I believe with hindsight would have killed me. They put me on chemotherapy, and again, what, what God did for me, he won't do for you. But that, I still have repercussions from the chemotherapy today. I'm anemic. Because my red blood cells, they destroy a lot of them. And God does heal some people through chemotherapy. You all, I've always got to put that in there. Don't ever think that what Pastor Ron did, you do. You do whatever God guides you to do. And I, I threw it away. You know the God story. I, I threw it all away. And the doctor says, this is all keeping you alive. You threw it away. God told me to. God told me to. And uh, so anyway, you know about that. Now, I'm not saying that God will lead you the way he led me. But without the Spirit's personal guidance, I wouldn't have made it. He guided me. He said, don't, don't do a bone marrow trial. No, 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 no. I mean, the Spirit said that. I told the doctor, well, i got to go talk to God about it. And my doctor, Ravi Patel, I love the man. Ravi's my good friend at CBCC. He'd always tell me, okay, I know I'm going to tell you something here, but I know you're going to go talk to God first. You're going to see what God says. I said, yes, I am, doc. I'll be back to tell you what God's saying. And so I'd go to God, and God would override a lot of that stuff, and he knew. He guided me step by step. I would have lost my marriage. My belief system saved my marriage. I would, wouldn't be financially stable today, but, but my, my faith kept me in there. Uh, my kids would not be saved. You've heard all this. I don't want to be redundant. Thirdly, it gives me purpose in life when I know why I believe and what I believe. See, I know, I know why I was born. I know where I'm going. And I know what I'm supposed to be doing in between time. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, stay with me. Are you not bored yet, are you? Okay, I'm watching the clock. Why do we believe what we believe? Well, here's a few subjects we'll be talking about in the next few weeks on Wednesday night. Eternal security, divine election, uh, atonement, signs and wonders, divine healing, qualifications of leadership, the spirit world, the gifts of the spirit, propitiation, what it means, the meaning of sin, the Holy Spirit, who is he, what does he do, the purpose of the church, second coming, sanctification, that's just a few. Now, I'm going to use a topical study tonight, 
And first you're going to go, oh, no, but you need to know this. I'm going to use a topical study, and uh, this is going to serve as a model for a lot of stuff we're doing. It's a model, okay? We're not going to rush through it. I'm going to give you a subject that I constantly get letters and emails and texts on. I, I got three letters in the last two weeks on this subject. People say, you're going to hell. Why? Because you don't obey Scripture. Right here is the Scripture, black and white. You don't obey it. And here's the question. It gets me Vegas and Bakersfield. Why do you allow women in the pulpit to teach? It's a big thing to a lot of people. A lot of people have left the church over it. It's not scriptural. It says right here, we do not allow a woman to teach. Right there, black and white, do. No, it's not black and white. So, they quote 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35. They, they quote that verse. And uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35. They quote it and they say, I gotcha. The women are to keep silent. Say with me, keep silent. Say it loud. The women are to keep silent in the churches. For they're not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their husband at home, for it's improper for a woman to speak in church. Gotcha, pastor. You're breaking that. No, I'm not. You're breaking that. No, I'm not. You haven't studied that. That's why you think I'm breaking it. I'm not breaking it. Now, when I tell you what it does mean, it's like a light bulb is going to come on. Before we take time to explain this, let me tell you why the explanation should matter to you. Because I'm telling you, if it hasn't happened yet, it's going to happen. You go to, you go to VBF, Ron Vietti's the pastor. He's breaking scripture. Let me show you right here. He puts Nicole up every once in a while, and he puts Vicki Loman up every once in a while. He's breaking scripture, man. And they'll try to get you to leave this church because your pastor's preaching on biblical things. No, I'm not. They don't know Scripture. And, but, but they're going to do it. And I want you to be able to say, let's sit down and look at the Bible. And I'll go through that with you. Now, uh, if they can get you to leave, they're going to. And they've got people to leave this church. And you know what? The devil uses that. Can you know why? He doesn't want you at VBF. He's that pastor's crazy. He'll teach you a radical walk with God. I don't want you there. I want you to go to a church where they won't teach this. I want you to go to a church where they won't teach you you have authority over demons because we don't like that. We're getting you out of here. And if you do, you could cheat your children. You could cheat your spouse. If it's a guy and you say, I'm out of here because they don't believe the word. I'm not sitting under any woman. It feels macho, doesn't it? I like Joyce Myers myself, personally. I enjoy listening to her sometimes. Beth Moore, every once in a while, I like to listen to Beth. But your kids need Gennaro. Gennaro's a man of God. That's our high school pastor. Justin Greer is a man of God. Kinsey Richmond and them out there, they're women of God. Your kids need them, and you're going to cheat them by getting out of here when someone pulled the wool over your eyes. Some of your wives need Nicole Dickey. Nicole's got a master's degree in, in theology. Her husband's a medical doctor. And Nicole, I know her well, and she is like one of the most godly women I know. We need to pattern after her. I can't say good things about Nicole. You know when she comes up here and teaches? She sends her sermons to me before to make sure they're okay with me. That's submission. That's submission. And Nicole didn't say, I want to preach and teach. We said, no, we want you up there. The Sunday before Easter, I've, I've asked Nicole, Josh, it was Josh's idea. I said, Nicole, would you get up Sunday before Easter and talk about the crucifixion and resurrection from the eyes of a mother, Mary? She said, I'm on it. I said, please, I want you to do that. Gang, I'm sorry, in March, I'm speaking at other places, man. I got a lot of speaking engagements in March. But you got good people here. I'm getting more and more of those, and I'm, I'm pretty excited. But uh, I will be here, try it one or two times a month in the next at least two. I'm trying. Uh, so you don't want to cheat your family because you, you got duped in something. Now, the, the devil and demons don't want you here. Now, of course, if we're breaking Scripture, you should leave. 
You should leave. We, you don't be so worried to break in Scripture, but we're not. Uh, first, a quick lesson in something called biblical hermeneutics. You heard the term? Biblical hermeneutics is the science and the art of biblical interpretation. Now, listen closely. For example, chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession says this. Where there's a question about one passage of Scripture, you must search for other passages and other places in the Bible that speak clearly on that subject. In other words, if there's one passage you just can't get it, go look for other passages that will shed light on it. Now, in Peter, I'm going to give you a verse here. Peter is speaking about Paul's epistles. He's saying about this about Paul. Look at 2 Peter 3.16 in the Message Bible. Some things Paul writes are really hard to understand. Irresponsible people who don't know what they're talking about twist them every which way. They do it to the rest of Scriptures too, destroying themselves as they do it. Because God doesn't contradict himself, neither can his word contain contradictions. It can't say one thing over here, one th it's opposite thing over here. No, the, the Word of God doesn't do that. So, well, I've taught you through the years too, very often in a lot of texts we want to read the letter, then we want to step back and frame it and say, what is this author trying to tell us? That's more important than the letter. What, what is this parable for? What, 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 what's he trying to say to us? Now, What's the lesson he wants to get across to us in that path? Allegorical applications. See, texts sometimes have different levels of meaning. And most important are these two things. Now, to get this down, in biblical hermeneutics, listen to me quickly. Context is king. Say with me, context is king. That's what biblical hermeneutics teach you. The second thing that's important, you can't support any doctrine with one passage. It has to be taught in other places in the Bible. You've got to exegete. Now, back to our question a little bit about Corinth. Let's, let's go about Corinth. See, see, here's the thing. If you read somewhere, some, and you didn't know anything about Las Vegas, not, you didn't know anything about Las Vegas, and somebody put out a thing and said, all kids under 18 must be with an adult in downtown Las Vegas. If you knew nothing about Vegas, you go, that's stupid. My kids are mature. They don't have to have somebody with them. But if you got educated about Vegas and all that goes on down there, then you would know. You go, oh, I do understand. We've got, before we study the book of Corinth, we've got to get a little bit of backdrop on it. The city's known for its sin and debauchery. Corinth was Las Vegas on steroids. In fact, when you say someone's from Corinth, it'd be a, a, a synonym for immoral. It was a port city. It was on a major uh, trading route. Uh, sailors were there all the time. So this was a bad place. Temple prostitutes want to go in and get a little religion, have sex with that girl over there, and you can get, get a religious high. I mean, it was bad. Hundreds of temple prostitutes in the temple of Aphrodite in the day. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 20 uh, with this in mind. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He, he has to tell them that because they got unrighteous all over the place. Don't be deceived. Sexually immoral, nor idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor those habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. All things are permitted for me, but not all things are of benefit. All things are permitted for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. However, God will do away both of them. Now, here he goes. Remember the sexual immorality? He keeps hitting it. This is the Corinthian church. But the body's not for sexual immorality, but your body is to please the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise up, us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are part of Christ? So then, am I going to take away parts of Christ and make them parts of a prostitute? I'm not going to have Jesus sleeping with a prostitute. No. Far be it from me. Or do you not know that one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? Hmm. For he says, the two shall become one.
flesh. If you've been with prostitutes, a lot of immorality in your life, you might come up for prayer. We might break some soul ties. That's not a scriptural term, but it's kind of something I use. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that the person commits is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. We're going to talk about this, but not tonight. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you're not even your own? For you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Wow. Now, obviously, you can see uh, why he's addressing the church in that sort of a way. It's because there was so much immorality there. And so he's, he's doing that. Uh, the fan is blowing my notes all over the place here. If I forget where I'm at, I'll preach you to death. So you better hope. Hallelujah. You're all for it, huh? Okay. So you see the backdrop here where he's talking about uh, all the immorality that's in Corinth. Now, whenever on a Greek stage an actor had to play the part of someone from Corinth, Corinth, they would always make him drunk as can be with a loose woman on his side. That's what they depicted him as. Now, the temple of Aphrodite, again, was there at one time, hundreds of temple prostitutes. I'm even told, and I don't know if this is historical or not, but that at some point, every woman was expected to sleep with a stranger and get money for it and give it to uh, the God. It was, it was a horrible place, just a horrible place. Aphrodite, Dite, of course, was the mythical ancient Greek goddess of sexual love and beauty, love, lust, pleasure, procreation. And so this whole thing was going on. Now, across the gulf was, was, was Delphi. And I want to show a map right here. I've got to put it in perspective. I want you to see this. You see Corinth and Delphi. Delphi's right across the, the, the Corinth uh, Gulf right there. It's pretty closely associated with the city of Corinth. Now, the temple of Apollo was in Delphi in its day. And the temple of Delphi was dedicated to the god Apollo. And it was also home to what we know as the Oracle of Delphi. And... The oracle of Delphi was a priestess named Pythia. She was the oracle of, of Delphi. And she was in that, that real popular uh, movement in that pagan temple over in Delphi. And they said that Pythia was so important, this lady priestess, that apparently got messages from Apollo, and then a priest would interpret what she was saying. Uh, they said that the elite wouldn't make any big decisions without going to her. They had to have her okay. And she would speak gibberish, like tongues. She, and, and of course, there were priestesses that came after her and tried to copy her. And it was said, and I don't think this is, is really, uh, you know, this mythical thing uh, tied with some facts. They said that there was a mountain around and there was gas coming out of it and they get high on this gas. They start speaking all this gibberish. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't even want to go there. Uh, but, but I want you to keep in mind that this was happening. Uh, now, obviously, uh, this, this whole cult and this whole Oracle of Delphi, it went out. And I don't think it was really going the time Paul was there. It had already been over with, I think, and done. But a lot, of the, a, a lot of the offshoots of this temple of Delphi made its way into Corinth and all the surrounding territory. So I think at the writing of Paul, there were still priestesses going out there speaking in gibberish, and they were trying to interpret. They said, I'm getting a message from Apollo. I think all that was still going on to some degree, and it was affecting the Corinthian church. Now, when we go to chapter 14, could that have been on Paul's mind? I think definitely. That, hey, they got these women out here, and they think they're priests of God, and they're speaking gibberish language. Sounds like speaking in tongue. I don't know. It could have been on his mind. I'm not, I, don't, I don't know for sure. I just think it might have been because it was in the communities around him. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul writes a letter to the church of Corinth. And basically, the letter of Corinth, what it's doing is Paul knows about a lot of areas they're struggling with, and he's come 
he's come to write a letter to correct all the abuses. And in chapter 14, he's talking about the abuse of spiritual gifts. And the main section of 1 Corinthians 14, he's trying to correct the abuse of speaking in tongues. That's the context. Trying to correct the abuse of speaking in tongues. Now, listen to me closely because this is going to get better. In previous chapters, he gave rules for prophesying and praying in the church. Because the church was full of confusion with that too. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 4 and 5. 4 and 5. I'm sorry. I need verse 5 too. 4 and 5. I'm sorry. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying in the church disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying and prophesying in the church. Okay, right there. Women were praying and prophesying in the church. They were speaking in the church. They were praying in the church. Right there. He says, I just want to give you some rules. Women, if you're going to pray and prophesy and, and start speaking out in the church, you just need to be, get some rules down. He says, uh, you know, you need to cover the head. Cover the head. So, the women were praying and prophesying in the church. I mean, right there, it's simple as nose in your face. Now turn to chapter 14. This is where the subject is, is this confusion about spiritual gifts. Now look at chapter 14, 20, verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it must be by two or three, most three, each one in turn and one is to interpret, verse 28. But if there's no interpreter, okay, now listen. If there's no interpreter, keep Silent. Say it with me. Who's he talking to? Men and women. If there's no interpreter, keep silent. Now look at the next verse. Have two or three prophets speak and have others pass judgment. He's given rules. Next verse. If a revelation is made to another who is seated, then the first one is to what? Say it louder. Keep silent. Now look at the next verse. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches and the saints. The women are to what? <laughs> in this case, everybody keep silent. In this case, keep silent. Women, I want you to keep silent. What do they keep silent about? They're not supposed to speak in tongues. That's context. They're not supposed to speak in tongues. That's, that context is king. He's saying you cannot speak in tongues. Could it have been because of the Oracle of Delphi and all the, all the cults around? I think it was on his mind. He's, man, I don't want women. I don't want somebody sneaking in here from the cult of, uh, of Delphi, that cult, and get in here and start. And, and it's all women. It's not men. They're all priestesses. So let's just, women, just, just keep it quiet. I'm not going to allow you to speak in tongues. you got to stay silent. Pretty crazy. Are you seeing this? Is it all coming around? Context is king, right? So, look at verse 35. Because it adds something here in verse 35. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it's improper for a woman to speak in church. Now, two things. Even John MacArthur says this. I think it was John MacArthur. I, I can't say for sure, I thought. But in those days in synagogue, women sat on one side, men on the other. Women were generally not educated, and they were whispering across the aisle going, hey, psst, 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 psst. what does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Look at the word speak in the Greek. It's, it's, it's main, and everybody thinks this is it. The, the Greek word is laleo, and it means to chatter or whisper. Secondly, it can mean announce or declare, but we rule that out because women are announcing and declaring all through Scripture. So the main, the, everybody will say the main Definition of this word is to chatter or whisper. Not speaking in the pulpit. You say, I disallow women to start chattering and talking to one another and whispering. I don't allow that because you're causing confusion when you do. So I think that this is very, very explainable. The only way you can take this another way is take it out of context. Keep silent over here, don't speak in tongues. Keep silent over here, don't speak in tongues. Keep silent over here, don't speak in tongues. And so it's really plain. Now, there's only one other verse left that talks about this. And there's only one other, one other passage you can take to build your doctrine. And because you can't build a doctrine out of one passage, it's already a moot point. 
don't even have to look at it. Because you can't make doctrine out of one passage. This passage has already been explained. But let's look at it anyway. 1 Timothy 2, 12 through 14. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Over man, very quiet. Now keep this verse up a second. The word teach there is in the present infinitive. It means a repetitive, ongoing, constant thing. And I believe here's what Paul's saying. I'm going to frame it. He's saying, I'm not allowing women to be the main teacher in the church, always up there teaching, always up there teaching, and, and usurping the authority over the man. I don't allow it. Now, VBF believes that the men are to be the leaders of the church. I'll give you my doctrine in a nutshell. I believe, biblically speaking, being countercultural, only men are to be the lead pastors. But I believe under that, a woman can do anything in the church the man can do. Anything. And, but I do think, and I, you can argue with me, but I think you're going to lose this one. See, with the marriage seminars, we, we speak on authority and submission structures. They're in the Bible. See, the Bible's so countercultural, some of you don't even know. Yeah, if a marriage, a good godly marriage, the man's supposed to lead, the woman's supposed to, even back to Genesis, right? Uh, the man gets a purpose, and he's a godly man, and the woman becomes a helpmate to him. I can't get time to talk about this. Do we all submit? We submit to one another. I'm not the, my wife sometimes, she says jump, and I ask her how high. I'm afraid of that woman. Uh, we talk about that later. That doesn't come in here. So back to our text, 2 Corinthians 2.12. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. He goes back to creation. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman. And so he, he gives this formula. This is why I don't want women usurping authority over men in the church. Because of the way they were made. Remember when Adam was first made, he had too many working parts. He had masculine and femininity. One day he'd be saying, lion, get over here. Bear, get over there. And the next day he'd be in his pillow going, I don't want to go out there today. It's just this time of month, and I don't want he had too many working parts. God, because God looked at him and said, not good. Remember? <laughs> not good. You hurt my feelings. And the next day, he's ordering lions around. God, so God caused a deep sleep to come over him. And I'm not, that's not an insult, women, really. I'm sorry. Some of you are looking at me like, yeah, I'm going to kick your whatever. You know, church. Because <laughs> uh, I got a young friend up here. She lifts a whole lot of weight in me. She could, she could whip me. Uh, so, what you have here, because of creation, he said, because men are made to lead. Because what did God do without him? Because of deep sleep to come on him while he slept. He took out the traits of, of femininity, softness, tenderness, gentleness. Took it out while Adam sleep and put it in the woman. He left the traits of masculinity. And then when he woke Adam up, and the one Hebrew text says, he says, he looked at Eve and he goes, wow, that's it. I'm missing something. And she's got it. See, that's why. Us men like that soft perfume, you know. Come on, back to Scripture, run. <laughs> At least I didn't say horny in this service. <laughs> Sunday, I cast the spirit out of horniness out of some people, man. And it just went right out of my mouth, and it was gone. Nothing I could do about it. That was the first service. You second people didn't get that. Uh, so now I'm going to start ending. So women can't speak in the church. Well, why don't you tell that to the woman at the well? Jesus chose a woman at the well, and he says, I'm going to save you. I have an appointment with you, female. I've got an appointment, and I'm going to tell you stuff to take back to the men and teach them. He chose a woman. At the resurrection, Mary was the first one. He chose her. He said, I'm going to show you everything, tell you. You go back and tell those mamby-pamby men that are back there crying and weeping and scared, tell them to put their big boy pants on and get over here to the tomb. He told Mary to do it. He could have chose a man. He chose a woman to take the message. Deborah was a judge. Hello? God chose her. Holda. Oh, my gosh, Holda. Uh, look at 2 Chronicles 34. Uh, where's my Bible? Oh, I'm getting old here. I'm going, where's my Bible? Somebody stole my Bible. And I was here the whole time. I'll tell you guys, it's the piss getting old. I watch Biden and that dude has vertigo, I'm telling you. It takes a vertigo guy to do it. I was at the gym, so I, I never had vertigo, and I'm getting a little bit now. 
And, and I was in the gym the other day, and I laid down with a 40-pound dumbbell, and I was spinning, and I walked by and just bumped the shoulder of some big old dude. And I said, man, I'm so sorry. He looked at me like, I said, man, I've got vertigo. <laughs> He looked, you know what he said? He says, I know who you are. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> but look at Holda here. Now, do you want to prove something? Uh, verse number 14. And when they were bringing out the money which had been brought to the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord by Moses. And verse 15, and Hilkiah responded and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Then Shaphan brought the book to the king and reported further word to the king, saying, everything that was entrusted to your servants, they are doing. Now jump down to verse 20. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, now listen to this, verse 21, go inquire of the Lord for me. Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel. Now jump 22. So Hilkiah rose, whom the king had told, and went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom. And he said to her, we need to hear from God. You know what she did? She went to prayer and she came out and preached a sermon to them. God chose her to preach the sermon. And the men respected it. They said, go to her, man. She'll, she'll, that, that, they said, go inquire of the Lord. And when they went to inquire of the Lord, they went to Huldah, a priestess, not a man. Wow, pretty crazy. Uh, you have Miriam. I'll give you the address. I don't have time to read anymore. Exodus 15.30. Anna, Luke 2.36. Daughter of Phillips, they were poor, four prophetesses. They prophesied, Acts 21.9. Phoebe was a deaconess, Romans 16.1. Lydia was ahead of a small group, Acts 16. Junia, Romans 16, 7. Priscilla, Acts, 6, Acts 18. Deaconesses in 1 Timothy 3. I could go on and on and on. Listen to me. If it wasn't for the women in the Bible, we would not have a church today. We would not have a church today. I think most women can do a lot of stuff better than men. I, I'm married. And my wife... She keeps the books. Some people say, well, that's a man's job. Well, not in my household. I have no clue how much money we have. I just ask if I can spend some. And she says, yes, I do. <laughs> I'm comfortable with my skin. You all know I bought my wife an electric drill for her birthday years ago. Okay. I hold the ladder. She drills. <laughs> I, I'm secure. I'm a, you're looking at a secure guy up here. I remember when we first got married, I was also spoiled. We've been married like six months, and we were living in Delano. And one night we were in bed, and someone, boom, in the living room. And I go, Debbie, 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 wake up. Wake up. You got to go see what that is. Go see. <laughs> Something just fell in the living room, Debbie. Go see. What are you doing? I'm going to stay here where it's safe. <laughs> okay, listen to me. You got to quieten these people who say, VBF doesn't teach the word. Did you see all those women? They were assistants. They were associates. I mean, it's all through the Bible. Now, Wednesday night, you don't want to miss next Wednesday night. We're probably going to do miracles, how we know miracles exist today. We're going to talk about some really crazy stuff. You want to be here. Uh, and this Sunday, I'm even doing something different on Sundays. I'm going to tear the Word of God apart on Sunday. So, I, I've been feeling forever. I'm supposed to be teaching, okay? So, I'll tell you what let's do because we're, we're supposed to get out. Was it too long tonight? This will be the hardest one yet, you know, because tonight was kind of your, what does that have to do with me, women in the post? What well, has a lot to do with you? Some people say, well, I still don't believe in it. I said, okay, if you don't believe in it, then Nikki's speaking on Sunday to all the women, and you're welcome to come if you want. <laughs> be free. Let's stand to our feet, and I'm going to pray, and then we'll, we'll, we'll sing a song on the way out. It's a very short song. Father God, Give all of us. I ask that the spirit that's on me would be transferred to the people. We need to become disciples of the word and defend what we believe of the word. Now, next week, Lord, if we get into miracles and divine stuff and exorcism, all this stuff, God speaking, it's going to get pretty crazy in here next Wednesday. You better come bring your notebook. And so, Father God, thank you 
And I don't know if you've been told in the back, but kill the music, because we're going to go out on a song. And uh, so we love you, and we'll see you Sunday. Or what? See you here, there, and in the air. Let's sing this song, and then we'll go out. We hope that you received something awesome from that message. We would love to hear from you. Please email us at share at vbf.org or visit our website, vbf.org. While you're on our website, you can donate to our ministry and follow us on social media. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you again.